First impressions are everything when it comes to establishing control of the game and authority on the field. And what most people don't realize is that you start building or losing credibility as soon as you walk on the field. In this video, we'll cover the time from when you walk on the field to the very first pitch, including the rules and procedures that you need to be aware of during this time. And while some of these details may seem small, there are important details that differentiate a championship level umpire from a first round umpire. Now, to go along with this video, we released a quiz to help umpires understand these procedures, and you can find the quiz in the video description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber from GHSA Baseball Umpire Development and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to our channel, and if you're looking for a packaged course for new umpires, either for yourself or for use in your association, you can learn more by visiting our website, umpireclassroom.com. To start, let's talk about going onto the field. Rule 10-1-2 notes that this moment is when umpire jurisdiction begins, so it's important that our professionalism shows at this moment as well. Remember that there are always three teams on the field in this sport, the two teams competing and the officials. And just like it is for the teams, it's important that the umpires present themselves as a cohesive team unit. This means that when we go onto the field, we always do so at the same time and walking together towards the plate for the pregame conference. Now, when we enter onto the field, our goal is to get into position for the plate meeting as soon as possible. And while we won't cover the details of a plate meeting in this video, know that it will always have the umpire in chief at the point of the plate in foul territory and all base umpires on the opposite side of the plate with fair territory. Now, it's not uncommon for us to get onto the field as a team is finishing up infield work or potentially with a pregame ceremony. When this happens, we obviously don't want to get in the way, but this isn't a time to hang out with coaches and players. If you can't get to the plate, simply stand off to the side in the area around home plate, but don't create idle conversation. And on that note, when we walk onto the field, don't look to create conversation with the coaches or dugouts. Now, that doesn't mean we can't say, hey, and good to see you, but it hurts our perception of being a neutral party if you're spending excessive time near a dugout. So once we get onto the field, go straight to the plate. Now, in high school and youth baseball, it's very likely that you won't get game balls until you walk on the field. If you're walking past the home team dugout and someone is there immediately to give you baseballs, then you can stop and quickly grab them. But if the balls aren't ready or there is not someone there to immediately give them to you, then continue onto the plate. There's a 0% chance that you're going to start this game without baseballs, so don't stand there awkwardly waiting because it looks like you aren't the one in control. And while it looks awkward for the plate umpire, it's even more awkward for the base umpires. We want to stay together as a team, move with a purpose, and establish professionalism. So after getting through the pregame conference with the coaches, this is an opportunity to ask the home coach for more baseballs if you don't have enough. Remember, by rule, we must start the game with a minimum of three baseballs, including the one the pitcher is warming up with. Next, we often have the playing of the national anthem. And again, this is an opportunity to demonstrate the professionalism, not just of the crew, but it reflects back on the league and the assigner you're working for. And the best place to learn how to look professional during the national anthem is from professional umpires. The correct positioning in a crew of two is the plate umpire behind the right-handed batter's box and the base umpire behind the left-handed batter's box. In a crew of three, the plate umpire slides over to the point of the plate to make room for the third base umpire. In those positions, both umpires will stand with their heels together, left arm down by their side, and right hand over their heart. For the appropriate individuals, it's also acceptable to salute. After the anthem, it's time for the players to take the field and the umpires to get to their positions. For the plate umpire, this is a great time to introduce yourself to the catcher and then see a few warm-up pitches on both sides of the catcher. These warm-up pitches are a great way to warm up and start seeing the ball better out of the pitcher's hand. For me, I'll usually introduce myself to the catcher, let him take two pitches, and then I'll see two pitches from both sides of the plate. After that, I alert the catcher that the pitcher has two more warm-up pitches and stand to the side while alerting the batter to how many pitches remain. For our base umpires, we jog in foul territory around first base and ideally to the grass just behind the infield near the second baseman. Now, one thing you will often see from professional umpires is they'll get the first and set up to see a few throws to the bag just like they would on a routine ground ball with no runners on. Just like working the plate, the idea here is to practice a few times, focusing on seeing the bag while hearing the pop of the ball in the first baseman's mitt. Just like seeing pitches, we don't make any calls or signals, 
but we're focused on squaring to the bag, locking in, and getting our eyes in the right place. So for most low-level umpires, this is where our responsibilities stop. But for our championship-level officials, they know there's a lot more to look for here that will keep you from looking unfocused later in the game. This includes that the catcher has a legal helmet that covers the ears, the pitcher is using a legal delivery and not pitching from the hybrid, and that the pitcher is properly and legally equipped specifically concerning items like glove color, sleeves, and jewelry. The rules also specify that for safety purposes, the batter do up and the on-deck batter may be out of the dugout, but all other offensive players need to be in their dugout. For the defense, players can leave the dugout between innings to throw in the outfield or run to the foul pole, but in either scenario, the rules require them to not delay the start of the inning. Those five details are always important, and it's very awkward if we notice them after the first pitch, because it shows that we weren't paying attention from when we walked onto the field. So as a crew, especially in the first inning, it's extremely important to look for violations in these categories. Now, on occasions with inclement weather, this adds another level of complexity. First, Rule 4-1-1 covers starting a game and says, the home coach will decide whether the grounds and other conditions are suitable for starting the game. After the game starts, the umpires are sole judges as to whether conditions are fit for play and as to whether or not conditions are suitable for starting the second game of a scheduled doubleheader. Then, Rule 4-1-5 says, the game begins when the umpire calls play after all infielders, pitcher, catcher, and batter are in position to start the game. So from these two rules, the big takeaway is that up until the game begins, the sole discretion on field playability is on the home team coach and umpires take control of that decision when the umpire in chief calls play to start the game. This is different from professional baseball and official baseball rules where umpires take over responsibility when the home team manager hands over their lineup card. So we need to know that for NFHS baseball, we can't make decisions on field playability until after we've put the ball in play to start the game. And on this note, if it rained before the game and stops raining, and then the coach says the field is good to go, don't go onto the field and rule the field unplayable as soon as you say play. If it hasn't continued raining or we aren't experiencing other weather conditions, let the game play because the coach is the one that made the decision the field is good, not us. We don't inspect every inch of the field before every game because the home team is responsible for ensuring the field is safe when the game begins. And one little caveat to starting the game is that if the mound on the field is uncovered for play, any bullpen mounds located on the field of play must also be uncovered. Those mounds cannot remain covered during playing action. Finally, after all these details, we've done a great job establishing our presence on the field and control of the game. And as the rules say, we should ensure the infielders, pitcher, catcher, and batter are in their positions and begin the game by calling play. So now that we've reviewed the rules and procedures, let's cover this week's case plays. Case play number one. What is the proper positioning for the national anthem? Is it option one, two, three, four, or is it up to the umpire crew or crew chief? The correct answer here is option one. The proper positioning for the national anthem will always have the plate umpire behind the right-handed batter's box and the base umpire behind the left-handed batter's box. Case play number two. Is this catcher legally and properly equipped for NFHS baseball? The correct answer here is no. This catcher is not legally equipped because legal equipment for a catcher in NFHS baseball must have a helmet that covers the catcher's ears. Now remember that for our umpires, it's a much better look to catch this before the game begins instead of a couple batters into the game and then all of a sudden we realize we missed it. Case play number three. What is the minimum number of baseballs required to start the game? Is it one, two, three, four, five, six, or is it a trick question and you wandered onto the wrong field and now you're working tonight's softball game? The correct answer here is three. By rule, we have to start the game with a minimum of three baseballs. Case play number four. When does umpire jurisdiction begin? Is it A, when the umpires arrive at the park, B, when the umpires go onto the field, C, when the home team lineup card is given to the umpire in chief, D, five minutes before first pitch? The correct answer here is B, Umpire jurisdiction begins when the umpires go onto the field for the game. Case play number five. Is this delivery legal for NFHS baseball? The correct answer here is no. This is not a legal delivery because it's what's traditionally considered a hybrid stance. 
What's important for umpires is that we want to get this either during warmups or on the very first pitch, but it's really awkward if we don't catch it until later in the at-bat or even later into the game. You want to get it as soon as it happens in your game. Case play number six, is this glove legal for a pitcher? The correct answer here is no. This is not a legal glove because it's gray, and by rule, a pitcher's glove cannot be gray or white. What's important here again is that the umpires notice this before the game begins instead of noticing it later into the first at bat or even later into the game. Case play number seven, a light rain has been falling for about an hour as the teams take the field. The field is currently still in safe condition. The bullpens are located on the field in foul territory. Can the bullpen mounds remain tarped while the game is being played? The correct answer here is no. If we're going to be playing the game because the field is suitable for play, then any mounds located on the field in the bullpens must remain uncovered. Case play number eight. When is the earliest the umpire in chief can determine a field unsuitable for play due to weather? Is it A, when they enter the confines of the field? B, after being handed the home team's lineup? C, after the conclusion of the plate meeting? D, after calling play to start the game. The correct answer here is D. The umpires don't take over responsibility for the playing conditions of the field until after the game has begun. And by rule, the game does not begin until the umpire calls play. Cage play number nine. How many players are allowed outside of the offensive dugout and swinging bats between innings? The correct answer here is two. By rule, only the batter do up and the on-deck batter are allowed to be out of the offensive team's dugout. Question number 10. Between innings, can the defensive team send bench players down the line to the outfield to throw slash warm up? Is this A, yes, so long as it does not delay the game, or B, no? The correct answer here is A. The defensive team can send their bench players out to the outfield to warm up and throw or to go run down to the foul pole. The only rule stipulation here is that the game cannot be delayed because of them being on the field, but they're absolutely allowed to go out there so long as the pitcher is still warming up and we're not delaying the game. Case play number 11. What does the umpire chief say to start the game? Is it A, play, B, play ball, C, begin, D, fire a starting pistol? The correct answer here is A. By rule, we always say play to put the ball in play, and we don't say play ball or begin, and we definitely don't use a starting pistol to start the game. Case play number 12. Which of the following are required to be in position for the umpire to put the ball in play to start the game? The correct answers here are that to start the game, by rule, we need to have the pitcher, the catcher, the infielders, and the batter in position for us to start the game. So there you have it, our review of looking professional from entering the field to first pitch. If you found this video helpful, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out our website at umpireclassroom.com. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you on the field.